Everybody, there's some DJ scratching going on in the, the audio feed there. That's, well, I feel hipper than I am now. Great. Anyway, uh, so Massively Fun builds games uh, using open web technologies, and uh, Goku, Goku, excuse me, not Dragon Ball Z, Goku and Massively Fun are currently collaborating on a multi platform, multiplayer uh, HTML5 game. And since we've been doing this now for almost two years, we figured it'd be useful to maybe come in and do a sort of discussion of the state of the union on HTML5 game development. What works and what still, what still needs work. So, we'll start with the easy point, success. Yay, you have already have a successful game. Maybe it's a DJ game. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, you already have a successful game, it's on iOS, fantastic. What's next? Well, most likely thing is you probably want to try and replicate that success by porting your game over to as many platforms as possible. If it worked in one place, it worked many places, right? So I hear that Android thing is pretty big, so we'll go ahead and I think we're gonna maybe do a port there. Um, I've been seeing some really nice stuff coming out of Microsoft lately, so let's do some Windows 8 Phone, while we're at, or Windows Phone 8 while we're at it. Um, and I'm sure there's another mobile platform out there somewhere that's got a bunch of traction and can really help you, right? No. Anyway, well, as long as we're talking about uh, uh, fun platforms, I hear there's a social network that's been driving some decent traffic lately, so you probably want to put something up there. And I'm sure there's some web platforms out there that aren't Facebook that probably drive reasonable traffic if you give them a chance. So that's, what, five platforms? Eh, no worries. Okay, let's try some ports. Okay, we know Objective-C, and I'm sure all the programmers in the room will agree that most programming languages are just basically the same thing. I mean, there's no real differences. And the libraries are all implemented the same way, and all the, yes, yeah, I can see all the programmers in the audience now. Anyway. Uh, so it's all identical, right? There's, there's, it's trivial. So you know, we know we're going to need Java for Android. And we're also going to need another flavor of Java for BlackBerry. I hear it's a thing. Um, and we're going to need some .NET okay, for our, uh, and C Sharp for our Windows Phone port. And if we're going to go on the web, Flash seems like the logical choice. So that's, what, five flavors of programming language for five different environments? Piece of cake will be done by lunch. Of course, we actually have to maintain all of that. That's a little worrisome. So now, you know, yes, there are shops that will port your app. And yes, you can wait until you have a big hit and you can go out and get those shops to port your app for you. But at the end of the day, you're going to be maintaining five separate code bases for the exact same game, which means you need developers either in-house or out-of-house that are proficient on every one of those technologies, or the Uber SWAT team of developers that understands every single one of those platforms and the technology. I think we have a name for those guys. Yeah. Or, I'm just throwing this out here, you could write all of your, game, all of your uh, game's design in standard HTML5 technologies, SOM, CSS, or Canvas, supported broadly. You could write all your game logic in one programming language, JavaScript, wrap it up in a project like Cordova, or uh, Lude's Cocoon, so it's able to be shipped inside native app stores, and then roll it out to pretty much every one of those platforms we just talked about. Yeah, even that one. So by being able to focus your development down into a single code base and a single project, you're able to put a lot more wood behind that arrow and ship updates to more, pro to more platforms simultaneously, which is a huge boom. So um, this is kind of crazy awesome, right? Like. You code it once, and then you get the entire universe for free. Um, unfortunately, like um, many things in life, this offer may not be quite as free as it seemed at first. Right? Um, there, are, you know, the, the promise is great. Uh, for one code base, you get smartphones, you get tablets, you get your desktops, even your smart TVs. I've had several folks approach me at the conference now asking, you know, do you have some content that's going to be TV ready for us? Uh, to which I answer, we're not telling it. But anyhow. Um, there are certain problems, though, with porting your UI and moving your user experience across. Um, our lead product right now is a, a version of the card game Dominion, which is currently in closed beta. Uh, this is a screenshot from it. And the circle is around the control that you use to buy a card during your turn, which looks absolutely great on your desktop. Maybe not quite sized right for your smartphone or your 60-inch plasma. So you really need to think about how's that control scheme going to port or, or is it? Likewise, even base interaction paradigms can be very different. Um, when you're on your phone, you're very, very used to kind of dragging everything from place to place. That works really well. It feels really natural, cooked right into the OS. Might not be the kindest thing for your wrist on your PC. That goes pretty fast. 
Likewise, all this helpful tip text that you've been dropping into your PC games for all these years, um, you know, when you roll the mouse over the thing, might not be quite as efficient on the phone where there's maybe, where's the mice? Uh, so I will say, often you wind up thinking hard and fishing very, very far for interaction paradigms that work uh, well enough on all these platforms without being exactly right for any of them. Uh, you wind up doing some very non-traditional stuff in terms of interactions, throwing away a lot of what you would traditionally do in a single click on a web app. And finding the right interaction paradigm can actually take up a good chunk of your development and design time. All right, I want to talk a bit about now about something that may not be as familiar to the, some of the older hands in, in the gaming industry, which is standards, as in interoperation. Uh, Turns out that W3C has been spent the better part of 20 years ensuring the content that's authored for the web is consumable on virtually every piece of hardware, software. It, you know, you, anybody can consume it no matter what hardware they're using, what software they're using, or what the network infrastructure is that's delivering it. They're the reason that content that was authored 10 years ago, anybody remember Visual J Sharp? Yeah. Um, <laughs> still works today in your modern browser. All of it whether or not it should. So that aside, there are some real advantages here, right? I mean, we're talking about what's essentially the largest game platform in the world. We're talking about billions of devices, dozens of operating systems, dozens of form factors, dozens of programming environments, and they all interoperate because of the efforts of this one standards organization. But forget all that. Xbox 720 is coming out. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be here by holiday 13. It's going to support all sorts of things that rumor sites keep telling me. I, mean, I don't know, no inside information, don't ask me afterwards. Uh, but, you know, and obviously it's gonna play my Xbox 360 games, right? How about my Xbox games? Or some 16-bit Windows games? I mean, Railroad, Railroad Tycoon might have been DOS, but it was pretty fun. I think it looked great on my big screen TV, played on my Xbox 720, so I'm sure that's gonna be part of the feature set. <clears throat> the real likelihood here is that the most recent generation of games is very likely, somewhat likely, possibly going to run on the next generation of hardware. Beyond that, all bets are kind of off. But what if, in some foreign world, all the console makers got together and said, we're gonna create a third party body that's gonna standardize how content is formatted and rendered, and we're all gonna agree to implement it in a way that is interoperable, so that your content authored in one environment will work virtually identically in another environment. Well, you'd have something that looks an awful lot like the web. Platforms come and platforms go. As a matter of fact, it's built into a lot of platforms. Planned obsolescence is actually part of the roadmap. But, so, if that group gave you the ability, basically, to, to, to not have to worry about whether the hardware platform came or went, suddenly you have a lot more flexibility in terms of planning for the future. If you look at the current generation of devices, and I mean everything, browser, uh, computers, phones, tablets, TVs, there's one common thread. They've all got a web browser. And all the ones in the future are most likely going to have a web browser too. So as free-to-play becomes dominant and you start to look at long-tail access to your content as more and more important, building for the web is a way to put your games on autopilot and be able to easily port them to new platforms as they come around, which means you can derive more value from each title. So I, I have a question for you. This is, this is actually my way of verifying you're awake. So. Question for you. Who is ready for the first great HTML5 first-person shooter. Hands. Who wants to see that? You ready for that? I got one little problem for you. HTML5 is not. So HTML5 does have 3D capability available through WebGL, right, an implementation of OpenGL 2 ES. But um, it's far from universal, right? Unlike the stuff that you can do with the canvas, giving you solid 2D representation. Um, the technology isn't that mature. It's missing on a bunch of platforms. Although I will say uh, iOS is particularly puzzling where it's supported in iAds only. So apparently it's okay to make fancy ads, but not fancy games. Um, someone from Apple will be punching me in the mouth after the presentation. Um, even Android, right, out of Google, the, the great bastion of <clears throat> HTML5 boosterism does not ship natively with a WebGL implementation, although there are third parties available. So um, it probably won't be the case forever that it's not there, but as of today, 
Uh, you really don't want to use HTML5 to sort of make fast-moving 3D games. Uh, what the Unity guy demoed, I wouldn't advise today on HTML5. So what is it good for? Well, it turns out that there are a lot of genres it'll do effectively. Board games, card games, puzzle games, word games, builders, 2D action and strategy games. Uh, there's a variety of stuff that you can do. So although it is technically limited, the question is how important is that limitation to your business? Because if you take a look at the kind of games that are on this genre, this is, or the kind of genres that are on this slide, um, this is exactly the kind of gaming that has turned gaming into a truly mass phenomenon and propelled casual gaming into the forefront over the last decade. There are billions and billions of people looking to consume and to pay for this kind of content. So as long as you're willing to work with the grain, you can build a substantial business on the back of your HTML5 games. You can address hardcore audiences with clever things like, say, the Dominion card game, but you have to be kind of smart about it. So genres Dave just mentioned have pretty much taken over social networks and mobile devices. I mean, you have hundreds and hundreds of developers shipping thousands of titles at breakneck speed. And one of the things we've learned over the last five to 10 years of web development and web-based game development is continuous deployment an incredible boon for figuring out what works and what doesn't. By being able to rapidly ship new code to your customers, you have the ability to iterate your way into a product that your customer loves rather than trying to get it all right the very first time. Now, I mean, this only really works if you can keep that cycle time, the gap between when I ship something, when my customer sees it, and when I can integrate that feedback into the next build, as tight as possible. Which, in 2008, 2009, when Facebook was the primary game de deployment platform, no problem. It's the web. We can ship new versions all the time. We can push new code out. Easy peasy. Fast forward a bit. Apple has adopted a somewhat less nimble model towards fresh code deploys. Um, it tends to look something like this, which is, at the easy case, probably a week's worth of your time, and in the more common case, maybe a bit more. And yeah, hopefully you don't wind up in sort of the bottom section down there with the sad face. So, I mean, we hear stories about apps all the time winding up in you know, the, the approval queue for days, weeks, months in some cases. Anyone remember the Commodore 64 emulator? Shipped, got pulled back, sat around forever because they tried to ship binary code out to their clients? Apple as a platform arbiter has a lot of control and unfortunately that means frequently you wait longer than you might like in order to get new bits to your customers. Contrast that with HTML5. We actually have the ability with these wrapper applications and with the base platform to dial up and dial down the amount of dynamism there is in our uh, applications sort of bootstrapping at runtime versus what we ship in the app store. At the extreme case, I can ship a wrapper application that does literally almost nothing except phone home for a copy of my game. And it can do that every single time that it boots the, the application, which is pretty powerful when you compare it to what people are typically stuck with doing inside app stores. There's another benefit here, which is particularly relevant for folks who want to play ship and uh, uh, manage cross-platform titles or titles that have backend. If you have a team that's used to working at web speeds for shipping new clients or iterating on the back end, and then you have a mobile team who's used to a somewhat more relaxed cadence, um, it's very easy to wind up with drift. We've got clients out there that can't talk to the latest back end. We've got clients on different platforms that are stuck because we can't release one without releasing the other because they all need to talk the same version of the back end. With HTML5, we can actually continuously deploy clients and servers and keep them in the lockstep, which is incredibly useful for trying to drive your product forward on multiple platforms at once. And this is the architecture you should use. Yes, Visual Studio and IS7. Anyway. So, you know, there's very little doubt over the last few years that um, the dominant platforms for gaming, especially for casual gaming, have changed, right? So, five, six years ago, this conference was really all about PC downloads, you know, digital, large digital uh, transactions on the web. Clearly, you know, Facebook and uh, mobile have become the new hotness. Um, but accessing this hotness now comes at a fairly significant price, right? So every dollar that you take in, Facebook, Apple would like to keep 30 cents. Um, may not sound terrible, but I want to point out that it's a, a pretty substantial difference. Uh, just as an example, 30% is the difference between six feet and four foot three. Fairly substantial. Um, this can make a real difference in your business, right? 
if you want to have a, a game that's playable everywhere, playable on browsers, playable on mobile, and not pay this tax, HTML5 can provide you this solution, but it comes at a cost. So the App Store, um, really almost anywhere, App Store, App Center, uh, if you get in there, get native, and work with the platform, is a major source of discoverability. In particular, uh, in the iOS App Store, you'll hear from virtually every top game developer that their presence in the top download charts, top grossing charts, top selling charts, is a huge boon to their sales, and they'll do whatever they can to get up there and maintain presence. This is a major vector for discovery for these guys, right? Or at least for free-ish discovery. Um, likewise, on iOS, right, the Game Center is not all that, but it does provide you some discovery through the, the player's social network, as well as a little bit of a vestigial social graph. Facebook, clearly you get tremendous benefits out of the viral channels, out of the pre-existing social graph, and the, the ability for players to interact with their friends. Um, however, in order to access any of that, you absolutely need to use Facebook payments as a requirement. You absolutely have to be ready to give up that 30%, and that is a lot. So it's a trade-off, like most things in life. Um, you have to think about whether this path, in fact, makes sense for you. Uh, there really is no way to be on Facebook as a Facebook app without using that, although you can access those users through the open web. You can do a simple framing application on iOS rather than you know, sort of deal with, um, deal with that 30%. So um, what do you give up? What do you get? Does it make sense for your game? Uh, if your game needs virality, focuses on viral play, this is something when you circumvent the platforms and save that 30%, you're going to give up completely. If you need to leverage the social graph in some way, if it's a game about social connection, right, that tends to be sort of a, a, a problem. So it works better for games that are either focused on synchronous play with strangers, solo play, anything that's not particularly social. You're giving up your ability to acquire free users at the end of the day through anything but traditional world of mouth channels. So if your game is intended to be masked, to spark interest in almost anybody who sees or hears about it, then giving up those three free users through those viral channels, through that discoverability, is probably a bad idea. If you're more niche or narrow, it may be all right. Your blended cost of user acquisition is going to go up. You've eliminated all the zeros from the cost column. So you're paying for everybody. So I think you need to make sure that when you can find and target the right users, you can get them at a reasonable price, and that your LTVs are high enough to support profitability against every single user assumed to be paid. If you can meet those criteria, then you can give yourself a dramatic boost by getting outside the tax framework. Otherwise, it may not be the right trade-off. So by show of hands, how many people were building games in here when the PlayStation 2 was released? Okay. Anybody remember, uh, anybody try to hire one of the launch title developers right after the PS2 was released? Did you send them champagne, throw rose petals at their, I mean, when new platforms come out, developers who are sort of on the cusp, who are really on the cutting edge and who are building compelling experiences, have a tendency to sort of attract a certain premium for their work. Um, this was very true back in uh, 2000 when the PlayStation 2 came out. And fast forward to today, we have a brand new platform. If you're a shop that has a taste for this sort of work, there are certain opportunities to be had in terms of your pricing. This is not a bad thing. Now, almost, I won't say almost every shop, but we have talked to shops large and small who are all looking at HTML5 gaming. Everybody sees this as something that's on the horizon. People are seeing EA's demos with really compelling you know, content. Uh, they're seeing people like, trying really interesting things, and they're thinking, well, this may be the platform when we want to try things. So, if you're a shop who happens to be interested in work for hire or helping do make you know, sort of helping large organizations make strategic decisions, now is a decent time to be in HTML5. It's not all rose petals and champagne, though. Um, if you're a traditional game developer, there's a fair chunk of skill sets that you're going to have to pull from other disciplines in order to be successful. Same goes if you're a bunch of web developers who want to try and build games for the first time. See, the fun thing about early early days in platforms is there are no best practices. There are no rules. We don't actually know how to do most of the things that we want to do, so we're going to make it up as we go along and find the things that work. So we're going to pull in things from web development. We're going to pull in things from game development. Heck, even a good chunk of server-side development turns out to be useful in a lot of cases. So if you want to be successful at this, 
you're going to have to make those decisions about investing in knowledge in all of those disciplines in order to pull it all together to make, make great games. Now, the good news is, even with all that extra effort, turns out uh, planned obsolescence isn't actually on the web's roadmap. So with a little bit of hard work, it doesn't have to be on your companies either. All right, so to kind of wrap up, where are we in terms of the state of, of the Union and HTML5 development? It's pretty early. Toolkits are still emergent. Platform distribution is still getting out there. Economics are still being figured out. Um, players are still being established. There's a lot of trade-offs to be made. Uh, you're writing yourself out of certain genres. You need to be clever to get really strong 2D performance, but it's doable. 3D, quite iffy. Right? And you have trade-offs around the business and how you interface with platforms. So you need to be pretty crafty and think carefully. Right? You have to be smart about what you're doing, understand your business, understand your customer, understand your product, and make good decisions around the, the platform for them. It's still time to be an early mover. Right? People aren't established. The market is still extremely fluid. So is it right for you and your game? I don't know. Ask yourself, man. All right, thanks everybody for coming. Thanks everybody. Happy to take your questions. We have time for about uh, maybe one or two questions if anybody has anything they want to ask. Um, if not, uh, or you don't want to, oh, there is somebody in the back. Um. Hi, um, can you talk a little bit about your, the security of game code within HTML5 and JavaScript? That sounds like a me question. That's you. Certainly. So I'm, depending on what environment you're coming from, uh, the security of HTML5 is roughly equivalent to any other environment where I can decompile your binary and pull out, uh, pull out your code. So there's no particular method for DRM, for encryption, that's going to work. So it's, which is roughly the same as shipping your flash game to somebody, right? I mean, if I have to have a key on the client in order to decrypt something, then I've basically already lost the game because I have to have a key on the client in order to decrypt something. Um, we don't have nearly as sophisticated DRM systems in place. We don't have a lot of the, uh, the, the sort of things that people tend to expect for larger, more heavyweight platforms and titles. Um, that said, I think we're roughly equivalent to where most Flash developers are in terms of obfuscation, in terms of uh, you know, sort of having client code that's at least hard to pick apart, if not impossible. Okay, great. If you have uh, further questions, uh, uh, Dave and Grant will be available uh, at the back of the room. So, um, and we'll start uh, our next session in about five minutes. Thanks. Yeah, cool.